Okay, thanks everyone uh, for uh, kind of sitting about and, you know, waiting for the beer and listening to me. Uh, so I'm uh, here to talk to you about emerging threats against cloud application identities. So this is very specific to non-human identities um, and kind of what, what you can actually do about them so we, we can protect them uh, in some way, shape or form. A uh, quick intro. So, yeah, my name's Johanna. I'm a senior product manager in the identity and network access engineering division. Uh, I specialize in identity threat signaling. Uh, hence, uh, we see a lot of the, the cloud application identities being attacked. Okay, really quickly, we'll go through um, threats that we are seeing. So I can go through some attack paths that we that we see quite commonly uh, against these non-human identities. Um, how to detect uh, contain, mitigate, and remediate, and also some best practice on, on how to protect these. Okay, so cloud application identities have many, many different names. So uh, we call them workload identities. They can be service principles. They can be uh, application identities. They can be app registrations. All of these different names, they all mean the same thing. So what we're focusing on today as I'm sure you know, there's lots of identities in this space. We've got our user human identities, which are assigned to a human, and then machine identities. And you see we've got devices, IoT, but we've also got what we're talking about today, which is our workloads and app services. So where are these used? So this is a very, very standard uh, OAuth2 client credential flow. This is uh, a grant type, so it's commonly used for server-to-server -server interaction, so it, it services from a uh, server to a API, for example. Uh, this is just a web service needing, uh, you know, directory data. Uh, most importantly, there's absolutely no human identity involved at all with this process. But why are we actually talking about this? So unfortunately, there has been a significant increase in the number of application identities being attacked. 85% of all identities across public cloud are non-human. So the attack surface is quite large. So this is what we are seeing. We are seeing 34% of organizations have already suffered a security incident by a malicious application. That's quite a lot, and it's growing significantly every month. Uh, we've had 26 million user login credentials actually stolen through malicious apps. That's 26 million accounts that have unfortunately been compromised. We've got 600 plus malware infected uh, sites that we are identifying every single week. And then 74% of organizations are completely unaware of the number of digital keys and certificates that they actually have for their application identities. If you don't know they're there, you normally can't protect them. And 48% of compromised instances attributed to no password or weak passwords for user accounts or, more significantly, API connections. So this is why there is such a problem. And so there's a number of different kind of buckets we put these attacks into. So we've got um, what we call a compromised application identity. So this is a legitimate application that has been compromised. Normally what happens is an attacker adds a credential to this already functioning application that is normally overprivileged. We then have uh, malicious applications. So malicious applications are, just as kind of it says on the tin, this is an application that is purely for malicious intent. It serves absolutely no other purpose within a tenant or environment. And then unfortunately, we still have a lot of misconfigured <laughs> applications within environments. This also includes putting your credentials in public GitHub. Again, not an ad something that we would advise. Um, and even putting the wrong URI so actually your data goes to the wrong place is common. So these are just some attack graphs. So these are kind of what the, the typical attack graph that we see for each of these. So we've got um, a compromised uh, app. So this is normally starts off with some kind of compromised admin account. So this can be uh, for, you know, talking about... Um, Azure AD kind of side of things, can be a cloud application uh, privilege or a global admin. The account is then impersonated. Great, they now put a credential on your application. They then impersonate the application, which calls an API. The API, nine times out of 10, what we see is absolutely overprivileged. I cannot express that enough. <laughs> if something doesn't need directory read write all, don't give it read-write-all. 
Okay, so this is for a malicious application. As I said, this is an application that serves absolutely no other purpose but to be malicious. So it, this normally starts off with a phishing email. Uh, and then the user consents to an app. So we do have uh, the concept of consent-based attacks. This is where a user clicks on a button and says, yes, attacker, you can access all my emails and impersonate me as a user. That's where it goes on to, impersonate a user. It's also used to fish other users. So uh, you'll see in the next slide, which was a real world example of what we saw, uh, actually they sent emails out uh, as that user that they, that they compromised because the permission the user gave was, yes, you can send as me. It then uses all the API calls that that user is given them access to. And this is one that we saw. So uh, this was actually during the uh, pandemic. And uh, the attackers were sending uh, COVID-19 bonus spreadsheets. Who didn't want to open that? The user then selected it. It looked like an Excel spreadsheet. Looked pretty, pretty standard. Um, but then when they clicked on it, actually, it was requesting permissions. But what the attacker did is they made it look like Office 365. So the user was like, oh, well, you know, that's definitely something we've got. It's fine. I can click on it. It's, it's safe. And so what they did is they ended up uh, actually giving permissions to all of these things on the side here. So uh, as you can see, uh, read your mail, read all your OneNote, uh, read and write to your mailbox settings. So they actually ended up putting um, a forward on to the mailbox so they could exfiltrate all of the emails. Um, yeah, and have full access to all your files as well. So... This attacker got quite lucky. The user selected accept. The attacker has now got a malicious application that is registered within that tenant and can just exfiltrate this data. Thank you. Okay, so this is a misconfigured app. Uh, this is normally leaked credentials. So we do have a service uh, where we scan a uh, public GitHub. And uh, day we turn that on, we have to notify 3,000 tenants that they had valid credentials. So this is quite a big problem. Um, we do alert on it. Uh, some action is sometimes taken. Some companies ignore us. Uh, so yeah, they discover leak credentials, impersonate the application. We do see a lot of uh, enumeration, uh, directory enumeration uh, with this method. And then they start calling the APIs that they've uh, got permissions to through the leak credentials. I understand this is a bit noisy. But this is um, one of our kind of very regular attack vectors, and this is what they do. And as you can see here, the on the application side, this is very, very much in their playbook to go after and make sure they attack non-human identities. So what you can kind of see here um, is it's all, most of them still start off with on-prem, kind of some kind of compromise there. They do do password sprays directly to uh, admin accounts in the cloud. Uh, you know, still less than 50% of uh, global admins have MFA. So it still works and it's cheap, which is why it's done. Uh, they sometimes do uh, quite sophisticated uh, models like attacking on-prem SAML IDPs. If anyone wants to know more about how they do that, I can talk about that uh, after this. Uh, but the whole purpose of this is to um, either get a credential to a privileged uh, account, normally a global admin or, as I say, a cloud application admin. And once they do that, then they move across. They either add a credential to an existing application or what they do is they create an application within the tenant and then they consent as admin. They have global admin. You've lost trust in your tenant. They can consent to directory read, write, all. And so what they do is they give themselves uh, permissions. It's normally mail. So mail dot read, write, all. The reason why they do this is because there's actually a lot of functionality that they can do with that permission, even when you've deleted the application. So you can find a malicious application in your tenant. You can find a credential that shouldn't be there, delete it, but they've actually got persistence. And the way they've got this is, like I said just before, is adding a mail mailbox forward. You can delete that application. The mailbox rule is still there and it still functions. We've seen this numerous times where data is being leaked. They've deleted a malicious application. Then they wonder why data is still getting leaked. And we find out that they've actually gained persistence. And this is one of the reasons why it's so popular at the moment. But not all is lost. 
you can detect a lot of these behaviors that attackers are doing. So some really simple ones, sign in and audit logs, your location, where they're coming in from, what are your applications doing? Frequency, most applications actually have very predictable steps. They're calling a specific API, they're calling it regularly, they're calling it, you know, six o'clock every night. It tends to be quite repetitive. Um, your credential type as well, when anything is being added to an application, if it shouldn't be being added at that time, there's no change requesting for it, you might want to start looking as to who added it. Uh, the user agent, so anything unexpected on there. The resource, if it's constantly accessing group.read and then all of a sudden it starts accessing something completely different that it's not normally accessing, you might want to just have a quick look. Uh, permissions, does the identity need these permissions? As I stated, <laughs> directory read write all is a very easy solution to get an application working, uh, but it's actually uh, very, very damaging as well. There's also things like automated threat detection. So uh, we've got like Defender for Cloud Apps, for example. There's lots of vendors that kind of do that, looking for some anomalous detections within within uh, the, the sign-ins. And also secret scanning. There's a state we do secret scanning in uh, public GitHub. Uh, you can actually build your own tools uh, to, to, to kind of scan your repositories as well uh, if you need to. But if you do find something, obviously, please do follow the, you know, instant response basics. Just stay calm. Involve your legal team, because if it's a non-human identity, most likely it is a loss of data that is happening. Be careful when sharing information publicly. I think that goes with kind of anything. And um, get help when needed. Uh, you're not on your own when there's an incident. And so when we kind of uh, started seeing a lot of these, we noticed that there's a gap uh, a lot of SOC teams don't know what to do or they don't have any guidance on what to do when they see this kind of uh, attack happening. So we have created some uh, incident response playbooks. It's in a flow kind of scenario here. Um, it does, it is for uh, Azure AD, but it can be applied to kind of any, any application technology that you've got. And so what it goes through is an incident uh, investigation process goes into whether the app's malicious or compromised because it's a bit of a different um, method to recovery. Containment and assessing business impact, and also the recovery process as well. Please make sure you have a process for non-human identity compromise. Uh, we see it a lot where there's a user one, but actually there's nothing for non-human identities. And so what do you do when you find this? So there is some containment and recovery that can be done. So if it's compromised, um, you know, this is a business application that is already in use by your organization. Credential rotation, this does have downtime. So it's really important to make sure that your business knows that that is going to go down. It can lead to significant amounts of money loss, which is why it, you might need to start telling your business owners. Most likely uh, an admin account has been compromised uh, with this kind of attack. So it's starting to make, to look at, well, who, ad who added that credential? Is that account compromised? How did that get com com compromised? Are there any other accounts that are compromised? So you start kind of going off into the, uh, you know, you may have lost trust within your tenant kind of scenario. And then, as I've stated, please do search for persistence. Uh, it's really, really important. Just deleting the credential and deleting the app, uh, unfortunately, is not enough. And then if you spot a malicious app, it's a little bit easier because you can just uh, disable it uh, or delete it. Uh, completely. It's malicious. It doesn't need to be there. It shouldn't be there. Again, search for your persistence, but then again, look at who added the application and most importantly, who also did the consent for that application. And if it's misconfigured, rotate the keys and please re reconfigure correctly. We do have some best practice as well. So, um, you know, these are good kind of security principles, so use strong credentials. We do recommend using certificates above keys uh, in this in, in the application scenarios. Uh, use least privilege, as I've, I've stated. Uh, good lifecycle management. We do see attackers going after uh, applications that are currently not really being used. Uh, so they, they do deliberately attack these ones. Please identify your app owners. Nothing worse than being an incident and you have no idea who to contact especially if it's business critical. Uh, restrict and monitor your consent settings. So a users, it is okay for users to allow consent for some things. 
read a profile is fine. A user can consent to that. There's no, no reason to block that. But just have a look at the consent settings and making sure they're appropriate. Make sure you are monitoring your application permissions as well and monitor for anomalies that are happening within these non-human identities. Okay. Most important slide, some go-do's. So please start monitoring. It is not good enough just to um, download logs. You need to actively be monitoring those logs, looking for uh, anomalies within them. We do have guidance on that in our SecOps guide uh, for, for uh, non-human identities. So that's what you can look at. Instill best practice across your workload identities. This is very much for developers as well. Developers need to understand least privilege just as much as the admins do. Create your incident response plan for workload identity compromise. As I say, we do hit a lot of problems where, yes, they've got them for users, but when it comes to non-human identities, uh, yeah, the SOC teams are a little bit stuck. And yeah, please make sure you audit apps and consent permissions within your tenants. Um, we have a, a script here that can do it for you. Um, I'm sure there's other vendors who can do the same, but yeah, please, please make sure that uh, you do that on a regular basis. And thank you very much. I think that's. Oh, do any questions? Yeah, if there's any questions. Three minutes. Uh, yeah. So thanks. Really good talk. I was interested with the the obviously they're non-human identities. So if something happens, um, you're saying. For example, deleting the app might not be enough, you know, with that persistence. What's been the sort of the average, I guess, threat op opportunity people have had, you know, days, months, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, we've, I mean, we've seen years. We, we you know, it's, it's there a lot. And, and they only kind of, we've seen a lot of, uh, kind of customers, unfortunately, only realize where they see data being leaked. Now, data can be leaked out of a tenant, but never used for years and years. They only, you were seeing attackers, you only use it when they actually need to. And so we have had, I think the longest I've had is 14 months that they'd been pulling data out, but no one knew. How, that, did, how did they eventually realize then after that sort of 14 months period? It was um, a compete scenario that they were buying another company with and their finances were leaked. On the... On the slide that you had for um, the uh, number of incidents and all of that near the beginning, is that across all cloud or was that specifically for like Azure? Uh, so it was a mixture. So that came from the Microsoft Defense Report, but also the Google Cyber Report as well. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much.